Thanks so much. Oh, thanks. <laughs> First of all, uh, thanks again to everyone who uh, came here today. Uh, obviously, we're not in our normal normal uh, location, uh, which is on the second floor, but we will be there for uh, next month's meeting. So we will be in room uh, 2.120. Um, I'd like to introduce our speaker for this session, uh, Dr. Donald Wesson, Chief Academic Officer for Baylor Scott and White Health, and also Professor of Medicine at Texas A&M College, College of Medicine in Temple. Prior to his positions at Baylor and Texas A&M, Dr. Wesson was chairman of the Department of Medicine at Texas Tech and also served as a member of Baylor's faculty. I think his presentation on the Choosing Wisely campaign is, is a very, very timely one, especially given re recent uh, events in the news. So please join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Donald Wesson. <laughs> Thank you. My pleasure to be here. Now let me see if I can get this slide to go on. That's a nice slide, but it's not mine. That one, there you go. So as, as we all do, um, uh, first of all, my uh, disclosures. So I am past president of the American Board of Internal Medicine and also past president of the ABIM Foundation. And it's the foundation that put together the Choosing Wisely campaign. So you will see my enthusiasm for the, the Choosing Wisely campaign. And that comes from my bias at long term long-time association with the, uh, the ABIM. Uh, not a member of any scientific advisory boards, but I am a member of a, a, a co-investigator on a small uh, business NIH grant. So choosing wisely, there's a lot about choosing wisely that you get from simply the name of the campaign. Choosing, meaning it is volitional. This is not something that is mandated is something that we practitioners can choose to do and hopefully the choices that we make are informed, smart, or wise uh, choices. So there have been a lot of things written about the Choosing Wisely campaign and much of it has been inaccurate. So let me talk about what it really is about and I'll say something in specific, uh, specifically about what it is not about. So it is about choosing the right care. And we'll get into how that we, we uh, led to this campaign in a minute. But it is, that is uh, encouraging conversations between, between providers and their patients that will allow them to, to choose the right care and avoiding the most care. So I was just talking with one of your colleagues that our reimbursement system unfortunately can sometimes encourage the most care and many of our patients will also think that the most care, that is the most that I can have done, the most that insurance companies will pay for or the most that I am willing to pay for out of my pocket the better for me. Well, we uh, providers realize that is indeed not the case. That is, the most care is not necessarily the, the, the right care or the best care. The most care can actually be dangerous. And so the idea is to promote these conversations between providers and their patients that will allow them to focus on the right care. Now, we, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about patient contribution to that decision making and uh, how important that is and recognizing that there, there are good literature that says that patient involvement in that decision making process helps to improve the quality of care that is being delivered to them. So the real focus of the Choosing Wisely campaign is promoting quality care. Let me say that again. The real focus is promoting quality care. There's been much that has been written about the campaign that infers or even says specifically that it is designed to reduce health care costs. 
The Choosing Wisely campaign is not designed to reduce health care costs. We think that when it is practiced in its fullest implementation, that it will lead to a windfall of a reduced health of reduced health care costs. But its purpose is to encourage the delivery of quality care and not um, to reduce health care costs. Well, how did we get started with the campaign? Well, it began uh, when we were having conversations about the physician charter. So uh, in 2002, many of us on the American Board of Internal Medicine, the European Federation of Internal Medicine, and the American College of Physicians got together and put together what is called the physician charter. It's published in the Annals of Internal Medicine uh, in that, that year. And it really is a declaration about professionalism, what physicians are about. There was concern at the time uh, on the part of the public that physicians were more concerned about things like remuneration, uh, uh, their own professional status, as opposed to being focused on the care of the patient, the welfare of the patient. And so that environment helped lead to the physician charter. Uh, Howard Brody, the famous medical eth uh, ethicist, uh, in response to the physician charter, proposed both in, in uh, presentations and in writing that physicians identify five things for which evidence showed that there was little value of them being done to and for and with patients, and that there may even they may even cause harm. So in response to that, the National Physicians Alliance, working on a grant that they got from the American Board of Internal Medicine Foundation, uh, developed three specific steps that they thought that physicians could take to promote more effective use of healthcare resources. It is interesting that most of these physicians were pediatricians, so they were skilled in talking with the parents of their patients. And so they developed mechanisms by which they could communicate with the parents in having a, a dialogue as to what was the best care to be given to their children. That evolved into uh, conversations that adult physicians would have with their adult patients as to how that conversation might be stimulated to uh, lead to uh, mutual decisions on what was the, the right care. So this led to what's called the five things list. So the American Board of Internal Medicine Foundation challenged um, mostly subspecialty societies, including my own society, the American Society of Nephrology, um, to come up with these lists. Now you might ask, well, why? the subspecialty societies, well, it looked like, by comparison, our primary care colleagues were doing a much better job in focusing on this right care issue as opposed to the most care issue. So we thought that the best bang for the buck in trying to get more of the right care as opposed to the, the most care would be focusing on subspecialty societies. And so challenged them to come up with a list of these five things uh, that met the, the, these following criteria. So within the society's domain, that is, we nephrologists couldn't point to the cardiologist and say, y'all need to stop doing that. So it had to be within our own domain. They had to be used reasonably frequently in practice. That is, not rare things, things that were fairly commonly used uh, and that, that there was generally accepted evidence to support the recommendation. That was a, an important part of it. So it had to be evidence-based. And the process is used to create the list should be publicly available. You couldn't come up with secret, secret reasons as to why these particular things were included on the list. And so we started off inviting a whole bunch of societies to, to do these, these five things lists. We initially got nine who responded. Fortunately, mine, the American Society of Nephrology, was one of those that, uh, that, that did so. But we're now up to nearly 100 such societies who have contributed 
uh, list that are now uh, publicly available. So from our standpoint, it was an overwhelming uh, success. A lot of lessons that we learned, but I have included three of the big ones uh, that came from this experience. So first of all, we learned that the listed items should not be absolutes, but simply worthy of questioning. So when the doc says we should get a pre-op uh, electrocardiogram and the cardiologist said well you should think about that it's not an absolute so it the it, it is we are not saying you should never ever get a pre-op electrocardiogram but it should re if that is on the list that is something that that the uh, the provider and the patient should think uh, about and the patient should be encouraged and emboldened enough to say, Doc, you know, do I really need that, uh, that EKG? It was important to frame unnecessary care as waste. And so that uh, characterization of unnecessary care as waste with the public really was uh, very effective in getting the uh, public's attention. Because when we talk about unnecessary care, many of the public would say, well, wait a minute, you mean you guys are doing things that's not necessary? The truth is, yeah, we were doing some things that were not, not, not necessary, but it didn't, it didn't have such cachet with the, with the public, and so characterizing it as waste was much better received by the public. And then emphasizing uh, physician professionalism, that was the key motivator. Rather than waving our finger at physicians that say you must, you should, uh, you should stop, uh, uh, focusing on their professionalism as providers was a key motivator in getting physicians on board for the Choosing Wisely campaign. So you might say, well, are we ordering a whole bunch of unnecessary tests? Well, the data suggests yes. And you might ask, well, what are reasons for ordering unnecessary tests? And all of the things that I'm going to talk about on this slide are, are uh, familiar to all providers. So for malpractice concerns, we want to make sure we actually get it right. We don't want someone looking over our shoulder and say, you should have done this when we've had a, uh, a bad outcome. But I would argue that the, the tort reform that we have in Texas, I think it's made this less of a concern. I think more of a concern is physician uncertainty. Um, for those of us who engage in uh, teaching medical students, uh, medical students really have a hard time to deal with this issue of uncertainty, where all of us who are uh, experienced providers, we deal with uncertainty all the time. I can, I can tell you when uh, we're on rounds and the, and, and the residents or the students would present a case to us or specifically to me, and they would say, well, Dr. Wesson, what do you think is going on? I'd say, I don't know. And the student's mouth would just drop. What do you mean you don't know? No, I don't know, but let's, we have a, a way by which we can figure out what's going on. And so that physician uncertainty is a real uh, uh, issue in, our, uh, in the practice of medicine. And you might say, well, how do we make that better? There are some folks that said if we have more evidence-based tools in our electronic medical records, I think that would probably help some. Should there be decision-making tools? I think the, those are uh, assist to us. But I would argue I think that the complexity of our profession will always lend for some uncertainty. These uh, tools will help. But my, my argument is that part of the, uh, the uh, profession itself is dealing with uncertainty. And all of us have dealt with uh, patient demand. Well, and I've concluded at least two things there that might assuage uh, patient demand. Uh, patient education, should we, uh, will that uh, 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 reduce the, the, uh, the patient demand? I think it's worth a try. I'm not sure if, how successful it would be. And tools to guide physician patient conversations. So the, I, I think that that is a particular way to go, and we're going to talk more about those tools. And ABIM, American Board of Internal Medicine Foundation, is in the process now of developing tools that it will help uh, providers uh, have those conversations. Because most of us in our training, 
we, we have not, in our training to uh, become uh, physicians and other providers, we've not gotten specific guidance as to how to have those conversations. So the ABIM, with the help of uh, organizations of, made up of uh, practitioners like you, have uh, uh, gotten on the road to uh, being able to design some of these tools. So we've done many, many uh, surveys to try to get input from the community to help us with this campaign. And so I've, I've listed a few of uh, the findings that we uh, have uh, uh, come up with. So two thirds of physicians feel a great deal of responsibility to make sure that their patients avoid unnecessary tests and procedures, two thirds. So we were delighted that the majority of physicians feel that they have that responsibility to make sure that their patients avoid unnecessary tests and procedures. But my question as a researcher was, what about the other third? Who do they think has the responsibility to make sure that their patients avoid these unnecessary tests? And I bet you know the answer. So that third that feels that it is not the physician's responsibility who do they say is the responsibility to make sure that patients understand this? I thought I heard it. The patient themselves, that, that was that's number two. What's the number one among this third? Insurance companies. Physicians, those third of physicians feel that it's the insurance company's uh, uh, role to make sure that the patients understand that. That makes me uncomfortable, but I'm very happy that, that two-thirds feel that, that it's our responsibility. About 60% of uh, physicians say they are in the best position to address the problem of unnecessary tests and procedures. And again, we were delighted to see that, and that's another reason why we are engaged in providing tools to help physicians uh, actually accomplish that. So about 80% of physicians are very comfortable talking to their patients about why a test or, or, or procedure should be avoided. And, and if you think about it, that's not a typical conversation that we have with patients. We, we providers are typically talking to patients about why you need to have this done. It is not common that we're saying you shouldn't have this. And um, because of, of, of internet and social media that's providing a lot of information to the public, we need to become skilled in, in having that conversation because there are many patients who are coming to us who are coming to you saying, look, I read about this. Can I get this done? And so if we feel that that is not an appropriate intervention for them, we need to be skilled in being able to have that conversation rather than just saying, no, uh, this is the reason why. And then physicians who have been exposed to choosing wisely are more likely to have uh, reduced the number of times they ordered or recommended test that was on the choosing, uh, that's on the five things test uh, list than those who did not. So that was, the, uh, was uh, gratifying to us that at least familiarity with the Choosing Wise campaign made physicians much more uh, comfortable and willing uh, to, to say no to uh, unnecessary tests. So now let's look at the patient perspective. Many think that the most care is the best care, and I touched on that already. And I think that's related in part to uh, consumerism because I mean, if you go uh, to Walmart and you get a, got a coupon, you want to get as much as you can with that one coupon. And I think many people feel the same way about uh, their health care. Most patients have little understanding that tests and procedures pose a risk for harm. But from their standpoint, if it's a medical test and is recommended by a medical professional, well, of course, it's not only good for me, but it is safe for me. And uh, many of us know that that is not uh, the case. And getting patients to understand the risk-benefit ratio can be difficult. So when I think about the risk-benefit uh, ratio, I think about three potential scenarios. So if you are contemplating driving the work to earn uh, money to support your family, and it's a nice sunny day outside 
like it is today, there is a small risk of your getting hurt or even killed on the highway and trying to get to work, but the risk is very, very small, and the payoff of your providing for your family is great, is very large. So that is a very favorable risk benefit ratio, and we all take it every day. I came down 35 today to, uh, uh, to be here, so we take that, that risk every day. But on the other hand, if there's a good old Texas ice storm and you are trying to get to 7-Eleven to buy a lottery ticket, well, the risk of your getting into a bad accident during our ice storm is pretty high. The return on your being able to, to, to cash in on that lottery ticket is pretty low. So that is a bad risk benefit uh, scenario that I've just described. However, with most of our, our medical tests, it's not that cut and dry. So you might think about it, uh, it's raining. We're having a good old Texas gully washer. It's raining hard. It's going to increase the risk of your getting a, getting into an accident, but not that much. We, we drive in the rain all the time, and you're trying to get to the grocery store to get a 10% off sale on bread. Well, you know, risk is up a little bit. The benefit that you're going to get there is relatively small. And for me, that's the kind of risk-benefit ratio, that in-between kind of risk-benefit ratio that we're wrestling with and trying to get patients, let alone even some uh, providers, to understand that can be a difficult chore. So patients have much access to a lot of health-related information today. Some of it good, as we were talking about, some of it. Uh, uh, less good, and most folks who are not familiar with uh, with uh, the medical world have a hard time telling the difference between what is good and bad or accurate or not accurate information. So lessons that we have learned through the number of years of this campaign now, we're into, we're into the fourth year, physician leadership is critical. When physicians take the lead not only in their individual practices, but within their own organization, that helps to move the campaign forward. Uh, however, our physicians require guidance as to how to communicate pa to patients about particularly saying no to tests, and I've alluded to that already. And one very important thing that we learned, the focus of the campaign should be on changing physician attitudes rather than trying to change their behavior. We, We've learned that we should focus on changing the attitudes. That's the importance of focusing on professionalism as opposed to trying to uh, change their uh, behavior. The latter does not work very well, but appealing to the professionalism of, of all of us as providers has been much more uh, successful. So one of the things that came up in our campaign was, well, we've, we've doing a whole lot with providers, but we also need to have the buy-in of the public and the buy-in of the patients. And we, being a nonprofit, a professional organization, had very little experience in interacting with the public. And so that's why we partnered with Consumer Reports, that is also a nonprofit, and they are very effective uh, in speaking to consumers and even doing so on, on uh, topics that have a strong scientific uh, basis. They already had a robust history of collaboration with specialty societies and, and the not-for-profit uh, not culture of Consumer Reports uh, resonated well and allowed us, an, another not-for-profit, not to work uh, well with them. So the, the, the uh, Consumer Reports has been really very helpful in communicating the, the uh, important aspects of choosing wisely and educating patients to allow them to be able to uh, effectively engage in a conversation with their providers regarding decisions for the right care. So key considerations going forward. Physician awareness is important. As I said, the more physicians are aware of it, the more likely they are to recommend against unnecessary tests Patient and public awareness is important, and so that's the importance of our partnering with uh, 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 Consumer Reports. And so the right care, 
again, not the most care, and referring to the unnecessary, unnecessary care as waste instead of specifically as unnecessary care. And in physician and patient engagement towards shared decision making, we would emphasize should become the norm. Not only is, is that a, a good professional way by which to engage with our patients, but there are now emerging data that says that the best quality care comes out of those provider-patient uh, conversations. So uh, this has also been uh, an opportunity to uh, engage in research about this, and there have been a number of insights that we have developed. So first of all, there is a need for de-implementation strategies. Uh, I don't know about your organization, but in my own organization, it is relatively easy to start doing a new thing. But it is so hard to stop doing stuff that has already been ingrained. And so trying to come up with what we're calling these de-implementation strategies is another thing on our clipboard of things to do to help individual physicians and their organizations uh, do that. So that when you start saying, we're going to start doing this, it should encourage a conversation to look at the portfolio of things that you're doing now and to see whether or not there's an opportunity to stop doing something. We need system structures to promote choosing wisely. What we have learned, including in our own organization, that appealing to even to the professionalism of individual members of our organization is much less effective than making it an organizational um, uh, initiative, such that the, the leadership of our organization says, guys, this is what we're going to do. These are tools by which we can do it. These are metrics that will measure how well we are uh, implementing this and, and so on. So it needs to be an organizational uh, approach. And translation of the marginal risk benefit analysis, as I've talked about, is difficult for many patients. I would also argue it's difficult to uh, explain that to many of our providers. And then when we talk about the uh, translation of unit and total cost concepts, again, that's one of the things that Choosing Wisely helps to, uh, we talked about a windfall of it being a reduced healthcare cost. Talking about that, uh, even among providers, gets a lot of eyes rolling over. But it still is an important aspect that we need to uh, get good at in doing uh, the Choosing Wisely campaign. So I've, I've given one example of a successful intervention from um, Choosing Wisely. Uh, this is a uh, hospital system, small hospital system, that was struggling with uh, ordering, excessive ordering of uh, cardiac enzymes. So those of us uh, old dogs that when we, we were trained way back when, there's a set of enzymes that we learned in our training, the CPK stuff and all of that, uh, that is ingrained in us because that's what we learned during training. But in those 40 years since uh, uh, those original cardiac enzymes that were determined to help uh, identify patients who had had ischemia, there have been a set of new enzymes and a combination thereof that the American College of Cardiology tells us are very predictive of patients who uh, might have uh, cardiac ischemia. And so this uh, hospital system decided, we're going to try to institute some choosing wisely stuff in an effort to get our clinicians to order the right test of enzymes, at least, and right set of enzymes, at least uh, as determined by the American Cardi College of Cardiology, and not spend money on the old school, unnecessary sets of, uh, of enzymes. And so they went about it in a relatively simple way. So they had information sessions for their providers, most of whom were in the emergency department of their hospital system. They gave them a pocket-sized reference card to where when the, when the topic came up, they could pull out that card and, and look at what, was, what were the uh, American College of Cardiology recommendations for enzymes to order. And they changed the computerized ordering system. Now, many of you are dealing with that 
uh, as we are uh, at Baylor Scott and White, and you often hear a lot of profanity on the, on the floor and dealing with it because when you often in, in situations like this, you'll say, "I uh, patient with ischemia, I want to order CPK, blah blah blah," and then a pop up comes and says. Wesson, are you sure you want to order those enzymes? Because the American Cardi College of Cardiology says a better test is blah, blah, blah. Get with the program. It doesn't exactly say that, but, I mean, that's, that's, that's the idea. And so, and they change their order system uh, in their system to, to give a pop-up and notice like that. The results were, I think, uh, amazing. It's relatively simple intervention. So the guideline concordant ordering increased significantly from 57 to 96%. That is, every time someone came in with ischemia, 96% of the time they ordered what the American Cardi College of Cardiology says were the right set of enzymes. The number of ordered tests decreased by two-thirds. Let me say that again. The number of ordered tests decreased by two thirds, and what is most exciting to me is that the in, the uh, incidence of an accurate acute coronary syndrome primary diagnosis increased. Now that 0.3 percent is teeny tiny. It was significant for the statisticians that are out there, but what is most important to, to me about that third point is that. Despite the decrease in the number of enzy uh, enzymes and tests that were ordered, it did not lead to a decrease in the accuracy of the diagnosis. So to me, this is the triple crown. You got improved uh, ordering, uh, more concordant uh, diagnostic ordering, the number of tests decreased, and the accuracy increased. And so it's, it's but one example of a relatively simple um, intervention that gave these outstanding results. So there are some challenges that lie ahead, however. Physicians now face increasing burdens and might find choosing wisely, not might find, some of them do find, choosing wisely just another thing I have to do. And so I am so, ha I'm so happy that when all of you heard about choosing wisely, there were no frowns on your faces and there were no things being thrown at me. Because when I talk to some physician groups, that's exactly what happens. Frowning is okay. Throwing things I advise against. But there are a lot of docs that are upset about this. Like, man, come on. I mean, the government is asking us to do this. Our society is asking us to do this. Now you guys come along and you got something else for us to do. So we still have a public relations challenge ahead of us. And we must find the time for patients and physicians to engage in these conversations. I know the deal. Uh, I'm trying to get... The, the encount all of this done in a 15 minute encounter, it is really difficult. And so we're looking for ways that these, this conversation can be done with by non-physician providers, possibly outside of the, of the provider uh, uh, patient conversation. We're exploring ways by which that conversation can happen. And the low level of health literacy in the public will challenge shared uh, the decision making. I had some literature to talk about that, but I won't go into the details. The bottom line is that many of our patients have such a low health literacy that they aren't able to engage in uh, effective conversations with us to help with that decision making. So that's a, a challenge for us going forward. So what do we need? Toolkits, and I've talked about that before, toolkits to help physicians uh, and encourage them to have the conversation, that helpful conversation with patients about choosing the right care. Uh, greater public and, and pa patient awareness of this, as I said, not only awareness, but education is also going to be helpful. And then uh, tools to help physicians and patients together better engage in shared decision making. And again, let me emphasize the shared decision making is not just a good professional altruistic thing to do for our providers. There are good data that says that it actually leads to better and quality, uh, higher quality health care. So I would argue that our state, uh, Texas, uh, should be a vanguard for choosing wisely. So we have the largest and by far the most active uh, physician uh, organization in state uh, level organization in the country. 
the Texas Medical Association. Interestingly enough, the, the American Academy of Nursing, uh, who was also on board with the Choosing Wisely campaign, they've chosen Texas as the pilot for Choosing Wisely to be done among nurses. It wouldn't be a great combination for us physicians and nurses to pair with them and get this done. And I, as I alluded to earlier, I think tort reform helps uh, to reduce the uh, physician anxiety about reducing unnecessary tests. So I think we've got a great climate here for choosing wisely. So major points to remember, physician leadership is key. Physician awareness, and I would add patient awareness, is important for the implementation of uh, choosing wisely. And the shared decision making between the physician and the patient is a strategy for enhanced quality of care. So let me stop and address any questions you might have. Yes, sir. Yes. That's a very good question, and I'll answer it from the experience of my own organization, American Society of Neurology. Uh, so although I, did, I was not involved in culling the evidence base, I uh, witnessed how the group of, of nephrologists uh, did it. So they came up with a list of criteria for studies that would fit, so that, was, uh, that would fit in terms of this evidence base. So for instance, if you had one uncontrolled study that said this, they wouldn't consider that. If you had multiple randomized control studies that supported an issue, then those were studies that were, um, were considered, and they had to be multiple studies. But it also began with a list of things that the nephrologists in the room recognized that we did very frequently that many of us thought, well, it's a possibility that uh, may not have some value and may have added harm. So once starting with that list of possible things, then the literature base was, was sought after, and the criteria that I mentioned was a very high bar, randomized control studies and multiple such studies to uh, support that. And then we ranked R to them. Uh, as I remember, we came up with about 14 things that fit, we are them frequently and they probably don't have any value, and there, were, there was a good literature support uh, for them. And of those 14, we fought it out in the room as to which ones were, uh, the, the, were the top five. So I can tell you how we did it with, uh, with the ASN, the American Society of Nephrology. I'm not sure how other organizations did it. My suspicion is, is that the process was similar. Yes. So it clearly is a challenge. I, I acknowledge that, uh, that the challenge is there. And as I said uh, from the top, a lot of it has to do with the reimbursement system, as we uh, had alluded to uh, earlier. And it's often, you know, all of us have, have been there, 
it is easier to order the test, to order the Z pack, than to have this conversation. Well, you know, you got this going on. It's probably viral. It's probably not bacterial. It's going to get better on its own. Here, Z pack. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And but but that's that's education on on um, on our part. We. We have to self-police. We, we providers have to have to self-police. But I, I acknowledge it is a, a, a big problem among our providers. Yes. Yes, sir. No, I, no, I get where you're going. Uh, it, uh, first of all, it's a real concern. Uh, and, and let me say that excluding the, 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 the profit motive, I'm not going to deal with that. We'll, we'll put that aside. But our colleagues legitimately tell us it's time consuming. You know, uh, in, in my own organization, uh, you know, it's not as bad as people with a stopwatch, but in my own organization, people are saying, man, you we give you 15 minutes, you did 20 on that. You got to tighten it up. And so the, uh, uh, the, the, the time that we have to spend with patients is so limited. And if we see something like this as an additional thing that is not going to add value, is going to get my supervisor uh, mad, and may even cut into my income, because at the end of the day, if I have all 20 minutes, visits as opposed to 15 visits that may well cut into my income. So that, that's one thing. Another thing, too, is uh, many patients, you know, as I alluded to, uh, they want to have these things done. And uh, by denying them what they want, you risk losing that patient as a, uh, as a patient. And, you know, if you are an independent practitioner that has real financial uh, implications. But if you practice in a place like Baylor Scott & White, where we're looking at your physician, at your panel of patients and seeing how big it is, and your bonus uh, being determined in part by the size of your uh, patient panel, that that still has impl uh, uh, serious implications to how you practice with that. So it, it is a real concern. I don't have uh, a specific answer to that concern other than the education that we're doing as an organization. Yes. Well, they did, the, the primary care docs have also stepped up um, with their own list and fortunately we did not have to encourage them. We went to the family, uh, to the specialty societies, but the, the primary care docs have stepped up and uh, have come up with their uh, with their own list. But as I said, our data and, uh, and and the data of others that are in the literature suggest that by comparison, the primary care docs are doing better uh, than the specialists. Not that their performance was ideal, but certainly much better. Uh, yes, sir, to my far left. Yes.
Yeah, there was an age uh, distribution there. The younger physicians more frequently said insurance companies. Us old docs were more like, no, 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 no. That's our responsibility. Yes, sir. There was another question in the back. Yes. Telemedicine is here to stay, and it's going to grow. And uh, I, I've talked with some of our colleague uh, leaders at the, at the TMA. I think they have good reason uh, to be concerned. Uh, and there are some circumstances where it really makes sense to, to have a touch-the-patient kind of relationship before you make uh, uh, determinations about what needs to be done. But I think some of us would argue that there are others where there's less of a need uh, to do that. I think that eventually telemedicine is going, the, the, uh, the public demand for it and the fact that it um, is uh, efficient and doesn't use as much resources, I think that's going to rule the day. And I think telemedicine is going to uh, eventually come to Texas in a way that is used in other states that have been more liberal in its use. So I think I think it's here to stay. Yes, sir. Yes. Yes. You know, I don't know what the uh, what the, the national data is on it. In our own surveys, it suggests that the defensive medicine part is a smaller part of the reduction. <laughs> yes. Yeah. No, the, the survey was national. Yes, sir.
and, and, and James, James is making my point, and I would add that the, the data shows that when there it was, there is unrefuted scientific evidence that you should do, you should treat this thing in this way. The average time for there is uh, uh, take up of that in the medical community is 17 years. 17 years. Well, but, but what it looks like, like us old dogs, I mean, it, it, antibiotics, you know, when, when I was a resident, genomycin was a big thing. I still use a lot of genomycin. And so a lot of it has to do with, the, with our training that sticks with us uh, forever. Yes. Well, I can comment at our own uh, uh, organization. We, we are using um, the, uh, the certified medical assistants to help us in, in having those conversations. And so they are aware, many of them are even part of the visit, they, they are aware that what is about to be or what has been recommended by the physician, and they can then carry on that conversation with, uh, with the patient. And that has helped to... Uh, increase physician satisfaction and also make the best use of their time so they can uh, e e uh, extend their time most efficiently rather than having that extended conversation which could take 10, 15 minutes, uh, we would have less expensive personnel do that. So that's one intervention. Thank you.